Hello, hello. Today the interview is going to be in English. A few days ago I had a phone call with a friend I met in Amaz Ashram and she is currently living in Ukraine where a lot is going on. So she wanted to share a few things. She wanted to share her point of view about what is happening there. Also she's going to speak about the situation in the United States and together we are going to speak about how it is to uh, find a balance between action in the world and spirituality. So I hope you enjoy this interview uh, in English uh, and I thank you from the bottom of my heart for watching it, for also supporting the video through liking or sharing. You can also send energy through TP, it makes a big difference. So enjoy the video. Hello, hello. Hi, <laughs> hi from Ukraine. Hey, uh, today in uh, this show, um, we are going to do something special because first it's going to be a show in English. Uh, because today we have the chance to have a conversation with a dear friend of mine, uh, Catherine Rutka. Uh, she's a student of psychology and uh, philosophy uh, from Orobido School. Uh, in California, and also I had the immense uh, privilege and pleasure to spend a few months with her in uh, Ama Ashram. And uh, recently we had just a, uh, a normal call, you know, between friends, but uh, Kathy, uh, because she's living in uh, Ukraine, which is a very uh, uh, important place right now uh, in the world, and uh, she wanted to share about the situation in, in Ukraine and maybe also a few topics linked to society and politics, but from uh, the perspective of someone who knows like spirituality and practice spirituality. And that's totally the point of this show. Also, I am very, very happy to offer a space for people uh, to express uh, different point of views. Uh, always trying to connect uh, ourselves from the source, but um, I'm, I'm very happy that this uh, show can be a space to express different point of view, especially point of view that are different from the mainstream narrative. Of course, we don't pretend we are going to share the truth, but I can sincerely uh, say that we are going to be yeah, uh, sincere and honest, you know, and if we do mistakes and if we share uh, mistakes, please forgive us, but we are really going to try to be uh, sincere. Mm -hmm. So welcome, Kat. Um, as usual, um, I like to share a little quote uh, before uh, we start the, the conversation. So uh, today it's a quote from, um, I think she's American, an American singer called uh, Patti Smith. So let's listen to what she says. I believe that this planet hasn't seen its golden age. Everybody says it's finished. Art is finished, rock and roll is dead, God is dead. Fuck that. This is my chance in the world. I didn't live back there in Mesopotamia. I wasn't there in the Garden of Eden. I wasn't there with Emperor Han in China. I'm right here right now, and I want now to be the golden age. If only each generation would realize that the time for greatness is right now, when they are alive, the time to flower is now. Patty Smith. Beautiful. Do you want to say uh, anything about this, those words? Well, it just makes me think of uh, what Gandhi used to always say, be the change you wish to see in the world. But that's something sometimes difficult to embody, especially when so much change needs to happen when it comes to environmental protection, ending the war. So it's figuring out exactly where you need to be I think that's the hard part, but mm, we definitely need. Yes, speed. that's that's the path of being a human, actually, a human mm -hmm. being, you know, with this uh, kind of twin dimension, like the, the more human part and the more being part, and we probably there is a movement to make them like 
be one again. Right, right, exactly. So we are going to go uh, deep into that, I hope, during this conversation. And before that, let's have a time for a one minute meditation. So my, there's no instruction, but my invitation for this time is to close the eyes and to maybe focus on the breath. And from this breath, like try to focus on the silence. And if there is no silence, just go back to the breath, you know, that's uh, in a few words, what I do if I do like long, longer meditation. Um, what, what would be your invitation for a short meditation? What, you, what would be your instructions? My instructions? Yes, uh, what is my, your way? Always my instructions is to you know, close the eyes and relax every part of your body. Relax all the muscles in your face, in your shoulders in your stomach, especially because we hold a lot of tension in our stomach and then um, relax. You know, I always have the hands up, palms up in a state of reception, receiving. And then at night, usually they say, you know, palms down. And so you, you're willing to receive whatever is coming. But the bit and then just allowing your whole body to fully relax and then begin focusing on your breath. Okay, that's cool. So it's a one minute meditation. So I, I hope we have, maybe we don't have the time to do everything perfect, but it's also just an opportunity to go back inside before we go into the, the talk and the words. So let's start. I was like, was that the bell? <laughs> Already in deep, uh, deep silence. Uh, always feels good to connect to the source. Um, so yeah, um, when we had this uh, call, uh, we were talk talking about different topics and I was uh, uh, very surprised because I remember last time uh, we had a call, you were in the US and uh, now you are in Ukraine, you know, where there is currently a war. And um, I was surprised and I felt like, wow, you're so brave, you're back there, uh, what's happening? And then we, we started to share about what was uh, really happening. And uh, you said that you, you would like to, to give a testimony about uh, what's really happening. So um, uh, to, to start with, um, when, did you, when did you arrive in Ukraine? Like how, how long have you been uh, there? I arrived um, August 6th, okay. so about a month ago, and um, I can't, I think it was August 6th, I can't even remember, <laughs> and um, so spent a lot of time with family reunions, and we were in the lake region, we were in the mountains, because the last time I was here was two years ago, I was also here in 2022, August, and I was here for four months. And that was difficult as well. Um, and it was a lot worse uh, in 2022. Uh, we had sirens going almost every day, sometimes three times a day. So you would hear these sirens. That, so uh, you could see the city from here. 
and um, they would play the sirens in the city and then you hear them even with earplugs and that's when you know incoming projectile is coming. And so the last couple of weeks I haven't heard any sirens because I've been in the lake region and the mountains and in the village. And then six days ago on September 4th at 4 a.m. all of a sudden you hear the sirens come on because we were in the city. And then um, my mother and I looked out the window and we saw, though we heard the sirens and then we heard an explosion you know, like right out here. And then we saw like fire, like uh, I don't know what they're even called, but just fire shooting across the sky. Like so, I don't even know what they're called. And so I recently went to see the destruction site. I'm not sure, uh, like 10 miles from here. And it, just from a small rocket, the damage was about 30% of the block was ruined. And that's from a small rocket. And I believe nine people died, 36 injured, and it was right near um, a medical hospital where some of the military are kept, uh, the injured from the military. And, and three girls died and the father lived. And I think that was the hardest part. And so this war has been very difficult for everyone, but also for me. Um, I was in Asangate, Peru on 2 22 celebrating with 22 others the portal. And, uh, you know, it was a moment of celebration. And then all of a sudden, two days later, my mother calls and she says, the war has started in Ukraine. And my heart broke. And I was invited to an alpaca festival and I'm trying to enjoy and I'm trying to throw chicha at the alpacas and my heart is just breaking, you know. And I wasn't and I felt at the time I lived in a spiritual community. And I, uh, Shambhala, and I felt like I couldn't live there anymore. How can I be happy when my my people are suffering? Like, because I was born here. I was born in Ukraine in 1982, and we left before we got our independence in uh, January of 1991. It's kind of an interesting story because I recently tried to get a passport here, and they're like, "Well, you weren't here when Ukraine actually began. After Ukraine got its independence, I left right before." Um. And um, because you, really you're happy. you're kind of a Soviet uh, citizen. Yeah. So when I left last... Ukraine, I was under the U, my mother's USSR passport. So it was wow. still under the Soviet Union. And so I saw the effects of communism and what happens when you're under Russia. We we didn't have our own currency. We didn't really have our own culture at the time. Uh, we didn't have any bread. Nothing was in the grocery stores. Everything was. Russia was, the Russian Federation was taking everything. Um, my grandmother was shot by a Russian. I, I don't hate the Russian people. I'm just saying, you know, I'm one of the people that get really upset when there's people that are saying, oh, you can't speak Russian. And they blame the Russian people because they are suffering too. This is a war between the governments. Um, you know, so I'm not a fan of all the hatred that's going on, but it, it was hard. It was hard for the Ukrainian people. The reason why they're such good farmers and gardeners is because the when they were under USSR, the they took everything, you know. And so as a child, I would see coupons littering the streets of Lviv, you know, because money, our money didn't even, wasn't worth anything. My father had to get up at 6 a.m. just to get bread. We had nothing. Um, but I was raised in a village, and in the village we were fine because we grew our own food. And so to this day, Ukrainians are really, like most of my family, they all have a garden, they all have chickens. They're very self-sustaining because of their past with being under the Russian control. So Ukraine does not want to go, uh, you know, back under Russia. But at the same time, I feel well, this war could have been prevented completely. And that is that is my thought. And um, it's just this destruction is not necessary. You know, um, back in the days, like more than 12 years ago, I used uh, to, to be a kind of independent journalist, you know, first writing in a kind of uh, local journal and then uh, writing for alternative websites in France. And I'm, I remember very well what uh, happened in like 2014. Uh, and there was... Uh, there was a change in the government of Ukraine and uh, 
And I was, uh, at this time, I just finished uh, studying what happened in the Middle East. And I remember I start to think, oh my God, that's a very bad sign. We will probably have a war soon because like the US and European powers, they want to cut the link uh, between uh, Russia and uh, Western Europe for gas and oil. And it's a huge market so that the right. US right. can sell um, their own uh, gas and oil to the Europe, but at, at a higher price, of course. And I, I felt it's going to be uh, very difficult in the coming years. Mm. Yes, I, <clears throat> as I was in the American military for eight years, you know, four active, four reserve. And I had my suspicions about the Iraq war from the beginning. Um, I told, I was telling my stepdad all the time, this is about oil, this is about oil, this isn't about terrorism. It was just my gut feel. And then I go into the military and my friends are telling me the same thing. The ones that were actually in Iraq and Afghanistan. And they're like, Kat, we joined because we thought it was about terrorism. And they, you know what they had us do. They're showing me pictures of how they were ransacking palaces in Iraq and stealing artifacts while the oil companies were coming in. And so a lot of them were disillusioned and they came back. And then I'm, I'm on this post in Fort Stewart, Georgia, and I'm dealing with suicide after suicide. We became the number one suicidal post in the nation. Why is that? You know, it's not only just like seeing the terror over there, but also the lie and how every war is based on lies. Iraq was a huge lie, weapons of mass destruction, right? And then they never found anything. And so I came out of the American active military in 2013. And then all of a sudden I'm seeing Maidan Square right after that. And I already had my suspicions then. I was like, okay, what is really going on? And then I'm seeing Zelensky, you know, being very close to the Biden administration and to the point where he even comes to parliament and he's kissing Pelosi on the cheek. And at that point I was like, oh, you, you know, I was like, you might as well put an American flag on Ukraine at this point. And I was heartbroken and I was like, you know, it's my gut feel. And I like, I can't really say this in Ukraine because every, most people support Zelensky. But my gut feel is that he sold Ukraine. And now Ukraine is being used as a test site for weapons, you know? And so everybody blames Putin for this. And, you know, of course he is to blame and he needs to step down. The Russian people deserve a new leader. He's extremely old fashioned and he has, uh, he has a list of his own problems, but I'm the type of person I like to put myself in his shoes. And if he ended up m meddling with Mexican, uh, the Mexican politics, we'd have a problem too. And that's exactly what's happening. So my gut instinct was Amer America ended up meddling in Ukrainian politics. And that becomes a problem with of Putin and he's upset. It's the same thing when uh, Russia put missiles on Cuba. Were Americans pissed? Of course they were. But the difference between the president back then is even though all the generals were pushing JFK into war, he refused to listen to them. Why did he refuse to listen to them? Because Eisenhower, before he left his presidency, warned JFK. He's like, be careful of the military industrial complex. It is its, 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 its own you know, monster, and it has its own activity and, you know, brain branch and has its own, I don't know, like, how do, how do I explain it? It's, it's on its own already. And so he warned JFK of this. And so JFK knew. So now all of a sudden, he's seeing all these generals push him into war. And he's like, No, I don't have to listen to this. So he had a separate phone line to Khrushchev, which uh, I forgot what his title was, I think, uh, international advisor uh with russia um and he for they say that like the 11 days or is it 13 days and he worked with khrushchev and he sent letters and also robert kennedy's father also he even remembers as a young child robert kennedy jr he's like we had this red phone line 
in our house and you can't pick it up because if you pick it up, it went directly to Krusha. So they worked on, on de-escalating the situation. And Kennedy said, JFK said, look, if we remove our missiles from Turkey, will you remove your missiles from Cuba? And then they prevented a war. And what did, what did they do? They killed JFK for it. And then they killed Robert Kennedy for it because why? They didn't toe the line. They didn't agree with the military industrial complex. So the same thing is happening now. And so we had, you know, the Biden administration that's instead of de-escalating the situation is instead escalating. And why is that? Who's making money from this war? I mean, just look at the stock market. You know, it's the same thing with coronavirus. Who made money from that? You know, it was the pharmaceutical industry. And they're they're both equal. You know, they're both the same thing. Um, and so that's the hardest part is realizing that Ukraine is, is a test site and uh, for testing these weapons and then um, the stocks go up you know, while Ukrainians are dying, and it's all over a lie, because, like, everyone says that Putin uh, invaded first, and I'm like, well, are you sure about that? Did he? Or is he just, you know, I'm not a fan of his, but I'm, but I also understand about understanding borders, and if he did the same thing with Mexico or Canada, if he stepped in and started meddling with Mexican politics or Canadian politics, we would have this similar reaction, and so now I'm like, can we please just have a president in Ukraine that's neutral, not with America and not with Russia? And I think that's the only way out of this mess. You know, uh, Kat, uh, this war situation, it makes me think about a book I read when I was a teenager. And probably this book had a huge influence uh, on my life. It's the book from the British a journalist and novelist George Orwell, 1984. And in this book, they describe uh, wars as ways actually to just maintain the economy, you know, in the society that is described in the, this book, which is very similar to our world, but at the same time, a little bit different. It's a kind of science fiction book. Uh, they explain very well how um, wars are created by the different systems because it helps them to maintain the political system and it helps them to run the economy. And they explain very well in the book that when uh, a war finishes, it's very important to create a new war somewhere else, you know, whatever the reason for this war. And when I read this book, uh, I thought, of course, that it, it has some truth in it, but it was mostly a science fiction uh, work. But the more I started to grow and the more I started to see the history and also what was happening before our very eye, I started to realize this is exactly the way it works. I, I don't see any wars, actually, that, that was started for the real reasons. You know, um, they tell us, oh, they start the war to defend democracy in Iraq, or they, stand, they start mm -hmm. the war because uh, this uh, politician was murdered in uh, East Europe, or uh, we start this war because the enemy start, start, started to attack uh, us first. Mm -hmm. But actually, when you study history, you, you realize that 90 90% of the wars actually they start for fake reasons or wrong reasons and that you have powers that actually needs the war uh, to, to, you know, to keep on, to keep on going, to keep on dominating the, the, the economic system. And if there is no reason to start a war, they will, they will create it. And that's why we had the lies about, uh, uh, the, this weapon of mass destruction. Um, also, if you study the war in Vietnam, it was the same lie, you know, they said that uh, an American vessel was shot by the Vietnamese, but many years later, we, we learned uh, it was uh, fake. And even now in, in the, I don't know if we should call that a war or a genocide uh, in Gaza, uh, we, we also know that many people from the, 
uh, intelligence services. They knew that uh, an attack is going to happen and same for Hiroshima, etc., etc., etc. Of course, now I'm talking more about uh, maybe the US because it's the, it's the dominant uh, power right now in the world. But actually, it's a strategy that was used also probably by France and United Kingdom uh, in the past, all these uh, kind of imperialistic powers. Um, so the thing is, you know, when I started to realize that as a young adult, you know, uh, watching uh, the war in Iraq is what can I do about that? Because the, the information is uh, funded by economy and economy is under the, you know, needs uh, the, the army, you know, because they need um, resources, you know, from uh, foreign countries. Um, and the politicians, they need the support of the media also. So it, it's, it looks like so huge that there was a time in my life where there was only frustration and anger. Mm -hmm. And I felt like powerless. Um, and I was really starting to think, yeah, what can I do? And uh, I, start, I, I was thinking if we give the information to people, people are going to change, you know? And it's true to some degree, people start to change. And, you know, if we cannot stop a war doing a demonstration, I think it's still important to do it just to send a message of hope to the other humans, you know? Okay, I, if I am Israeli, maybe I cannot stop the war in Israel, but I can show that I disagree, you know? Um, and I think it's something very important. And the, also the thing I found and maybe it's the most important, even though it's the more most subtle. Is uh, I think I really started to try to change myself. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. I remember when I was watching George Bush and his corruption and lies, I start to feel like I'm not going to lie anymore. I'm not going to steal anymore. I'm not going to. I I will try not to be a part of this of this energy anymore, you know? I'm not going to feed this Western monster, uh, right. which is always frustrated and always wanted more and conquire and everything. And, um, and actually that's the way I started my spiritual path, to be honest. Mm. Right. Yeah, I mean, a couple of things I wanted to say. First one was about George Orwell. That's not science fiction. The reason why he wrote 1984 was because he was a part of these secret meetings. I, I forgot what years it was, 50s or 60s, where he saw these agencies actually talk about the surveillance state. So not science fiction. He knew it was coming. They were they were they were he was already hearing it in these secret meetings with and and so that's why he wrote 1984, the surveillance state. And that's already happening. China has the most number of cameras in the world, admit five million cameras. They can find a person through faith through a face within five minutes or five seconds even. And um that's like the one of the main reasons why I was against the Biden administration is they're a little too close to China and how the way Chinese thinks, um, the Chinese the with the censorship and the uh, lack of freedom of speech, but also the masks, you know. You know, a lot of people say with the masks it's about pollution, but it's also about silencing. There's a lot of mental uh activity that's happening with wearing masks all the time and they um a lot like with the previous administration they wanted those masks on full you know all the time and so a lot of us were worried and so that's why i, I was working with robert kennedy jr i've been following him since 2020 i've listened to most of his interviews you know and for a long time, I prayed, I, I felt that the last greatest president that we had was JFK, you know, and that's why they killed him. They kill every, every human that actually wants to do something decent, like Martin Luther King, Gandhi, Nelson Mandela, they all get killed, right? So I knew that was the last greatest president we had, and we've had nothing but horrible leaders that are tied to the military industrial complex since then. And so I was like, if we could, you know, I was hoping for 10 years, if we could just have a Kennedy type of president, you know, 
Then somebody, then I found out about him in 2020. I start following him. And I realized what an amazing human he is when it comes to environmental protection, getting the, getting the fluoride out of our water. And then he starts attacking the pharmaceutical industry and they start calling him a wacko because most of the mass media is paid for by the pharmaceutical industry, 60% of the funding. So they're attacking him like he's some quack and conspiracy theorist. But you know what happened when, uh, when COVID hit? There was a million people that gathered together, I think, in August in Munich, a million people. And Robert Kennedy was one of the speakers, and he was talking about medical freedom, that what is happening right now is called medical fascism. There's, there's so many studies that have been done about these masks that they do nothing to prevent a virus. But yet everybody wants everyone to wear a mask. Why is that? Back to the surveillance state, you know, it's about it's about keeping you quiet. It's about taking away your power. Don't become powerful. Don't speak out. And you know, and I've I've been following him ever since then. And no media covered it was even though a million people showed up to Munich to you know go against these mandates and these lockdowns. It's you know, communism, fascism, whatever you want to call it. No media outlet covered it. So that means censorship is already here. Maybe I definitely saw it in 2020 with, I was being censored all the time on Facebook. Then anyone that was going against the anti, was against the vaccine was shut down, was their videos was taken off YouTube. And now anyone that talks about, talks against in social media in Britain is getting arrested. Um, I think they took down Robert Kennedy's Instagram and he, he jokes because he's like, I now know how to go against censorship. You have to run to become president. That's the only way you don't get censored because there's a rule against it, you know? And so he ran because he was, he was really upset about what was going on. And no, actually, it's not, it's not that true because I remember, uh, I think they shut down uh, Donald Trump when he was a president. And yes, yes, I yes. remember I was realizing, wow, yes. they, are more, they are more powerful than mm -hmm. the man, I mean, the person who's supposed to be the most powerful person in the world. And I started to realize the shift that was happening that uh, the, I mean, the kind of democracies we have, I don't know, I mean, in my opinion, they are not really democratic, but it's still like the system we had in the West. I could see like the, the last remnant of democracy in that system uh, starting to fall down, like between, I mean, of course, before there was the wars, but the wars were always against people abroad. And when I start to see the, the COVID, I, I start to feel, wow, now they are really starting the war against us. Like not only the economic war, because there's always economic war, you know, between the rich and the poor, but now it's starting to be like, yeah, like the start of this kind of, I think you, you used the right word, like uh, uh, pharma, uh, big pharma fasc fascism, you know? Um, Medical fascism. And they, they could they could uh, st stop the president of U of the USA to to express himself online. I was like, wow, they are very very strong. They are not afraid of anything. Yeah, I know. That's why I was really happy when Elon Musk took over Twitter. He was extremely upset with the censorship. He took over Twitter and um, he released all the files to Robert Kennedy. He, so so that Robert Kennedy had Robert Kennedy Jr. because they're also friends. So he had enough of a case to go against the White House or Biden administration for censorship, because you can clearly see that the White House is telling him the Twitter, you can't talk about this. You can't talk about this. They're telling Google. They're telling YouTube. They're talking, telling Facebook. You can't talk about this. You, you can only be pro Biden and pro vaccine. And so I wanted, you know, because a lot of people are against Trump and they think that he's an idiot and blah, blah, blah. But I wanted to take a moment to say that. He was right about the border. He was right about the drain the swamp. And he was the first to give doctors a forum to speak, even though doctors that were speaking out against the vaccine were silenced on all platforms. He gave them a platform to speak. And he was also the first one to say, hey, you don't have to take the fancy thousand dollar drug pushed by Fauci remdesivir, you know, because it's all about money. Um, you can take ivermectin or hydroxy. And then he's being labeled as crazy when they're using, I bought ivermectin in Peru for like a couple of dollars 
people are going across the border to Mexico to get hydroxy. We could have cured this thing from day one, but for some reason in America, all of a sudden you can't get ivermectin or hydroxy. This was mass genocide. You know, this is genocide on a global scale. Anyone that doesn't realize it hasn't been following all the court cases. I've been following all of them. They put Pfizer on court, you know, in the lawsuit in the British Parliament. They brought the, the Pfizer CEO didn't even show up. So his assistant came and they're like, did you even test for transmission with these vaccines? And they're like, no, they admitted in court that they had no studies. And even though in the beginning they were saying 98% efficacy, now they're saying 0% efficacy. It was never tested. And now you've got people that are dying, sudden deaths. We have, because I've been following the data from the VA as well, The from the veterans. Uh, the veterans have a really clear data of, of the stillbirths that's happening because of these vaccines, the sudden deaths, the heart attacks, the myocarditis, but also the vaccine adverse reporting. So I'm following... Uh, like Dr. Robert Malone, he invented the messenger RNA vaccine. He became the whistleblower against it. He says, this is not a good idea, you know, but everyone's pushing it because they're making money. Like Pfizer and Moderna stock rose through the roof, you know, so this is called biomedical warfare. You're making money through medicine. So you're now there's two ways that America is making money, biomedical warfare and weapons. And you can't have these companies won't make any money unless one, there's a virus or two, there's a war. And so they have to manufacture. There's, there's plenty of proof now that the coronavirus was leaked from a lab. And a lot of people, many people say Robert Kennedy, Robert Malone, uh, Rand Paul, anyone that has done any research on this and has written books about it, that this virus was man-made, you know? So I don't know. It's just crazy, you know? It's crazy what's happening. Yeah, it's crazy. And um, uh, of course, we cannot explain here all the details. And I think also people, they can do their own research. Uh, what is obvious to me is that uh, if you're sincere, you can easily find uh, information. But it's also seen that some people, psychology or pro programming, uh, push them uh, not to look for this kind of information. Uh, and uh, for, for a long time, it was difficult for me to understand. You know, you say you give an information to someone and you are like kind of neutral. Like, I mean, I have nothing to, to sell and uh, I'm not even in a kind of political party. I'm, I'm just very interested by, by the truth. You know, I like to understand things. But when you share some information with people, you realize actually that they, they cannot really accept it, you know? And um, that, um, that is very surprising, you know, uh, because as human beings, we see ourselves as being uh, free to think and to take decisions. But uh, those kind of uh, informations, I mean, it did not start with COVID, you know? When we were speaking about the Iraq war in the 2000s, you know? You were telling to the people, hey, we have a journalist who says that there's no uh, weapon in the, of mass destruction in Iraq, and it's a lie, you know? And people start to say, how can you say that? You know, uh, it's on television, so it's true. Um, and um, it starts to make me realize that people, I mean, human beings, actually, they are not that much uh, rational. They are not that much uh, free. And um, that we, we need to, to, to a lot of patience and a lot of effort, you know, to, to explain things. But even if sometimes you explain things very well, there is a part of us that is not rational at all. Uh, it's this kind of maybe of the uh, reptilian brain, you know, I believe that, you know, that things that tries to make us secure as a body and as a mind, you know, and it will simply refuse what you have to share, you know, like alternative point of views. And that's why also I think I started to be really interested in spirituality because I felt maybe spirituality will help me to, to detach from this reptilian uh, brain tendencies and see more um, uh, myself as part of uh, a wall. And and uh, 
And at the same time, I have also to accept that not everybody is on the same path, you know, not everybody has the same mindset and the same interest for spirituality or truth. So um, it, uh, it pushes me also to be accepting, you know, to accept the world as it is right now and still trying to do my little part, you know. And that's why I, I really admire people like you. Uh, uh, last week also, I was interviewing a, a woman who was working for a fantastic uh, NGO. And I really admire people who at the same time can be um, accepting the world as it is and still doing something, you know, uh, doing their part so that this, uh, this, world, this world is uh, taken care of, you know, like we, we take care of this world like, like, a, like a loving gardener or, you know. Right. Yeah, I just want peace, you know, and I, I keep telling people is, uh, you know, why can't Ukraine just stay neutral, you know, so that it keeps everyone happy. And I keep telling everyone I meet, you know, and uh, I, I guess I wanted to talk a little bit about how I started my spiritual path. Um, I was in college, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo studying electrical engineering. Um, drinking a lot, smoking cigarette, smoking weed, you know, and then once I started to smoke weed, I, I remember questioning my degree. I'm like, how did I even get, get here to, to study engineering? Is this even what I want? And then all of a sudden, you know, cause I'm being raised, um, Orthodox Catholic in Ukraine, um, we never had conversations about reincarnation and all of a sudden I'm talking about my Chinese roommate is telling 2 a.m. after like 14 shots of Jose Cuervo we're having a conversation on reincarnation and I'm like well what's this reincarnation I never heard about it you know because in Ukraine we're being raised to believe that there's this god with white hair up in the sky and he's always judging us you know that's how I was raised and and it's funny, the timing of things, because here we're talking about reincarnation. And the next day I'm walking through campus and there's a Hare Krishna monk on campus. And he's wearing, you know, the all orange. He's got the Bhagavad Gita open to the part where you see as the soul transmigrates through all the body forms. First in animal form, then it goes to human form. And then, you know, death, old age, and then start again. And, and it, the timing of it was beautiful. You know, it's a Carl Jung synchronistic moment and I'm like that's exactly what we're talking about and then I'm invited to um a Hare Krishna meeting I go there there's this old lady there and she's got the, the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra you know printed on a piece of paper she's like you don't need to know the meaning you just need to start chanting it and then I'm being taught how to sing it and I meet my first yoga instructor and I just go into it like full force like a child and I'm like, yeah, okay. I start chanting it. I start reading the Srimad Bhagavatam, uh, Prabhupada's books. I start doing yoga. And the mantra was so powerful. The vibration of this mantra is so powerful that within one month, I quit drinking, I quit smoking, I became vegetarian, and I started doing yoga. And ever since, and this was in 2005, you know, so 20 years later, I'm still chanting and I'm chanting everywhere I go. I go to Sri Lanka on the the beach i'm chanting krishna mantra shiva mantra i go to ukraine i was here in 2022 for four four months you know i was just chanting my way through the streets because i figured this was the way to solidify light into this region so that it was protected and for the most part viv and this region has been protected thank god you know because there's a lot of history here so i mean people may not believe in the power of mantras but i do um and the Sanskrit language is extremely powerful. And the reason why it's different than the English language is I feel English is created for the material world, but Sanskrit comes from the cosmic realm. And so when you're chanting and it's different than when you just listen to mantras versus when you chant. So I'm always outside and I'm chanting. So I'm bringing I'm, the vibration is coming out of me and into me. And it, I'm also putting it into the atmosphere. And so what you're doing there is you're bringing the divine or the heaven into the earth. You know, you're bringing the above and you're cementing it into here. 
And so people may not believe me, but we had the most beautiful winter. You know, when I was chanting my butt off two years ago, they haven't had a winter like that since then. And I feel that. I feel like when you're working with, actually, anytime I was chanting the Shiva mantras, a hail would come. You know, and with Krishna, Krishna does a lot of like cleansing the field and also works a lot with your throat chakra. But as soon as I started chanting in 2005, I felt it. I felt like the energy going through my chakras. I began to listen to my heart more, my soul more. I began to retreat into nature more. Um, but now, I the last couple of years, I'm trying to figure out. Okay, well, how can I help? You know, where where can where can I be of most use? Because um, there's a lot that can be done on this planet, and then that's why I was working on the Robert Kennedy campaign because I felt these wars are going to continue unless we elect a leader that's not backed by the military industrial complex. You know, it's one thing with the Middle East; we sort of it sort of becomes normalized. We get used to. To it. Well, Middle East has been at war for the last 30 years, but then all of a sudden it's your, it's my birth country being bombed. Like where I was born has been hit six times. They, they're currently afraid that they're not going to have power for the winter and they're not going to have warmth in the winter time. So now, you know, even, even though I was upset with the Iraq war, now it's like, now I'm really upset. Now the military industrial complex is here, you know, where I was born. And now Ukraine is being affected by it. And that's, you know, and that's the hardest part is trying to figure out, how, you know, how can I help? You know what you said uh, make me, makes me think about uh, words from uh, Amma. So... <clears throat> Because in the spiritual world, there is, a, there is a tendency to see the world as unreal, you know? Uh, I believe uh, it's a way for people to um, protect themselves, maybe, uh, psychologically. And also many, many teachings, you know, they, they share this idea that this world is not ultimately uh, real. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, that's why, you know, uh, many spiritual paths, they encourage us to, to live uh, society and, and, and live more, you know, in monasteries, uh, in, in this kind of uh, lifestyle. But well, there's, a, there's a word for it. They call it spiritual bypassing. Yeah, actually, I would love to have your point of view about that. But, um, you know, Ama, I felt that she was connected to the highest uh, truth and at the same time she was always in a movement of taking care of the world like mm -hmm. she built an ashram but it's the most opened ashram I've ever seen you know it's like it's a mix of monks and uh, totally like I would say normal worldly people you know families with kids going to work every every morning and I remember she used to say you know um, when there is a uh, a fire at the ground floor don't believe is not is never going to to touch you uh, because uh, if even if you live at the last floor of the building the fire is going to come you know and i always understood this uh, this statement as a kind of way to okay maybe i'm not directly uh, touched by what is happening in israel or in the amazon forest or in uh, in ukraine and and for sure being uh, sad and uh, full of hatred won't help anyone. But if I can approach those issues with uh, sincerity, trying to understand them, bring uh, consciousness on them, you know, bringing the light of consciousness on them, and mm -hmm. at least not uh, giving energy to the to the powers that are doing uh, uh, harmful thing there. It's already the start of a big difference, actually. And uh, mm. so, yeah, I would like to hear you more about this uh, spiritual bypassing, you know, like. I, th I think that was the main reason why I left Peru. You know, I was I was living in this community. Well, what happened was um, COVID hit and <clears throat> I was actually in Amaz Ashram with you when uh, when COVID hit. And I didn't, I started to get yelled at for being on the beach. And I was like, well, I, I'm not going to wait out a pandemic if I can't be outdoors. 
So I decided to leave and go back to California because they didn't want my mother to be in lockdown by herself. And in California, you can't shut down the beaches because, you know, there's a lot of them. <laughs> but then California got a little bit crazy and I was completely against the vaccine and um, the enforcement of it uh, for many, many reasons. I was warned about these vaccines from even at Amazon people. Oh, it's getting loud over here. Hold on. Anyway, so I decided to leave uh, California because it was getting a little too crazy. And I went to Peru and I found this, you know, amazing spiritual community. And it was great because. Is, is it a little bit too loud? That's OK. What, what is what is this noise? They're doing uh, construction outside. Oh, OK, that's fine. That's fine. We, we can. No, no, we, we can hear you perfectly. Thank you. Please, please go on. Okay, um, great. So, so I ended up being a part of the spiritual community doing plant medicine and we were singing kirtan uh, once a week, sometimes twice a week. We were doing ecstatic dances on Saturday and um, in plant medicine ceremonies. And I felt like I was living in Shambhala. I even said it. I was like, this is a heaven on earth, you know? But then as soon as the war in Ukraine started, my heart, you know, my heart just couldn't, I felt I couldn't just stay in this heavenly place and singing my way while, you know, my people, like my home country is suffering. So I went back to California. I was in California for three months. And then I convinced my mother that, hey, we should go to Ukraine. And, um, and I felt I had to spend some time in Ukraine doing mantras to try to, like, I don't you know, cement light energy into this region so that at least like this particular region was protected. And, um, and it was crazy because there we were like sitting on the floor. We're like, are we crazy to go into Ukraine during a war? You know, and my mother's like, well, it's too late now. We already have the, the tickets, you know? And the thing is, is we make it a lot worse in our heads. Um, of what the situation is really like and and then we you know we start going and traveling and then we realize it's not that bad I mean yes Ukraine is at a war and the sirens are going and it is scary but if the Ukrainian people can get through this so can we and it's I don't like I don't know I don't know how how else to say it but it's not uh, Sometimes I feel I'm not doing enough. You know, when I was here two years ago, my I felt like my spirit was pushing me all the time to speak out more about this war, and I couldn't, I couldn't seem to do it. And so two years later, here I am, like, and I have this opportunity with you, and and hopefully, um, to speak out about hey, what's really going on, so that to raise some awareness on the topic, because otherwise, Ukraine, if they keep going like this, because now Ukraine is attacking. Uh, Russia even more now and if they keep going like this you know it Ukraine will be destroyed just like Iraq was and um and it's a lot of hatred you know and it's a lot of hatred fueled by lies uh when people need to realize that who's making money from this destruction and wake up and actually elect leaders that are you know not backed by the the military industrial complex and and it was interesting because I was just in New York and then the person that I ran into um, at at a spiritual festival, Krishna Das, Krishna Das was singing in Woodstock. And the person that I ran into is Andre Dumont and he's got, he's a podcaster and he has 500,000 um, people listening to his podcast. And I, and I keep, I start talking to him about my channel that I created when I was here in Ukraine two years ago and how I kind of gave it up. And he's like, no, you can't give up. You have to start somewhere. And then I asked him, I was like, can you please have Robert Kennedy on the show? Cause he really needs to be heard. Like everything that he says, you know, so I'm, I feel like I've been working for Robert Kennedy for the last four years. Cause he's a really good human. And he's like, literally he's fighting every day for our rights, for free speech, for leadership that doesn't support the wars. 
And it was interesting because here I am, like, literally, he's in the top 10 podcasters. And Andre's like, actually, I'm going to have him on my show in three weeks. I just felt that it was too late. And I'm like, no, it's never too late. Give him at least two hours. Like, he needs to be. So sometimes I feel like I'm not doing enough. And sometimes, you know, my spirit is telling me, no, you're doing the best that you can. You know, you're traveling. You're you're talking about Robert Kennedy. You're talking about the situation in Ukraine. And you're doing the best you can. But other times I was like, no, you need to do more. <laughs> and it's difficult because it's difficult to follow your heart, you know, follow your soul because it, and I think that's why I love mantra so much. I, I wouldn't have traveled to 26 countries. I would never have served in the military. I would never have met Robert Kennedy or I even met Trump. Uh, well, no, I heard him speak, but you know, I wouldn't have done any of what I've done if I, if I wasn't chanting, chanting, uh, Krishna mantras or Shiva mantras always kept pushing me outside of my comfort zone. And I think that's the problem with a lot of people is they're not being pushed outside of their comfort zone. And it's not just mentally waking this up to a higher consciousness and not believing the main narrative, which requires you to come out, come out of your comfort zone. We're being fed one thing to believe on TV, but you have to shut the TV off, start doing, start praying, start chanting in my mind meditating, whatever it is, connect to the source, and that'll tell you what the truth is. And then you'll verify that with your own research. And so we need an awakening on a massive scale. But at the same time, like you said, everyone is at a different consciousness level. And that's the hard part, because I feel Ukraine, this war will continue until unless people wake up and start doing their own research. Um, you know, recently I was speaking with a friend and uh, um, I was telling him, you know, maybe we cannot influence uh, too much uh, the huge waves, waves of uh, darkness or ignorance or hatred, you know, like uh, what we are wit witnessing right now in the world is probably the state of... Uh, our minds, you know, like our collective minds, this is where we are. And maybe we cannot change the big picture, but um, we can surely contribute to nourish that in us. And if we nourish that in us, it will automatically flow around us, you know, wherever we are. It can be our friends, our family, and um, it can uh, probably also nourish some what I call like a um, bubble of light, you know, like maybe uh, <clears throat> small communities, uh, small companies, small media, and uh, all these little streams, they will cre create the, the big uh, rivers of tomorrow. And uh, uh, of course, you know, Krishna always says that the result uh, of our actions in, is not into our hands. And it's, uh, it's sometimes a very hard uh, thing to swallow, uh, especially with uh, like Western state of mind, like, you know, where we are used to, to think that we can achieve things and use our willpower. Um, when sometimes it's also about uh, being able to let go the result. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, I feel it's very important to support the Dharma, you know. Uh, um, of course, in the spiritual path, we speak a lot about happiness and moksha, but uh, Dharma is, is a part of life. And, uh, and sometimes it's, it's more difficult to follow uh, Dharma. Um, but I, I believe that uh, if, we, if we follow the Dharma, if we follow our heart, because it's the same thing, actually, you know, the Dharma is not outside. It's really trying to follow what feels right for us. Um, I, I believe it will contribute to the realignment of this world. And I believe also that the forces of the planet, you know, the spiritual forces of the planet, the life force itself uh, really, really, really supports that, even though it's invisible. Uh, it really supports us into that and the, the gift is uh, a tremendous 
amount of uh, faith and uh, and so yeah that's uh, that's a different gold to to look after you know uh, but i feel it it worth the um, the journey yeah no it's true anytime i get confused and i'm like what am i doing in new york right now or what am i doing in in ukraine right now and or i don't know what my next steps are i always write pray and on the other side i write flow you know if you're ever confused just pray like you know go outside and start doing your mantras or meditate and then the rest is just flow be like water one of my favorite quotes is by bruce lee where he would say be like water but also i really love yoda you know be one with the force and that's not always easy to follow the force um because sometimes I can even feel energy. Like I feel like, okay, maybe I should go to California now. And I feel that the energy is blocked that way. And I feel like the energy is pushing me this way. And then that's how I went from New York to Ukraine. And that's a difficult decision to make, right? Ukraine is at a war. You, you're not, you know, another, you know, I don't even want to talk about it. What happened six days ago? It was scary. This whole building is shaking. And, um, but you know, with prayer comes a lot of faith. And even two years ago, everyone would have the, the apps installed and they're warned when rockets are coming and they go into the underground. I never went, I never installed the app and I never went into the underground. I was like, you can't outrun a rocket. You know, if, if a rocket comes into this building, it's just gonna come. Um, and so I just never let the fear come in. I just fully believe that this region is protected and I'm gonna keep doing my mantras and we'll be fine, you know? And, and, for, and for the most part, you know, Lviv has been fine. Um, and so faith is definitely important and prayer is important. And we have to, um, you know, there's one of my favorite quotes is from Fellini, I think an Italian screenwriter. I just wrote about this, I, I heard it, I first heard it in under the movie Under the Tuscan Sun, where he said, live spherically, but also never lose your childish innocence. And so faith is very similar to a way a child thinks, you know, and we can't, we have to keep hoping for peace. We have to keep hoping that we'll have conscious leadership. We have to keep hoping that people will become conscious and will fight harder for peace than, than stock rising, you know. And as Jesus said, if your faith is as strong as a mustard seed, you could move mountains. And anytime my mother or any one of my friends get scared and I was like, nope, if your faith is as strong as a mustard seed, you know, it has to be stronger than anything else. And for many, many years, I thought, why was I born on this planet? Like, why during this time? It's a crazy time, COVID and all these wars and everyone, everyone taught says that we chose each one of us chose to come down here during this time because we thought that we could make a difference that we could make change you know and so anytime i drank ayahuasca 37 times when i was in peru for a whole year and ayahuasca kept telling me you know a lot of different things but one of the main things she kept telling me is you're going to be spreading shiva consciousness so i just that's what i try to do anywhere i go i'm chanting you know trying to do my mantras and I feel and I see the the energy change I see there's a lot more rain or you know and this isn't like a god complex I'm just saying this is what happens when you use uh when you start working with the deities and how you're able to bring the magic of the divine realm into the earthly realm and so another thing that I want to say is you can escape you can escape into the mountains and 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 start meditating you know like the sadhus and or you can escape into the forest but then why did you decide to come here you know why when all of this is happening we, we could have just stayed up in the divine realm it merged with the god consciousness so yeah i think we're supposed to spread our light as much as we can yeah it's um it's probably one of the fields in my own life and in spirituality where I have the most doubt because uh, I crave for peace a lot. You know, I really like peace. And at the same time, I'm so connected to the world. Um, it feels like sometimes I have a monk 
soul and at the same time a, a revolutionary soul kind of and it feels um, not easy to discover that path uh, for me uh, it's one of the reasons why probably I started the channel you know um, I, I really feel there is a there is a right place for everyone to reconcile those two dimensions uh, yeah like reconciled uh, world and uh, spirit like not being too much idealistic and at the same time not to me to be uh, too much uh, materialistic for sure <clears throat> you know the source of happiness is inside us like I remember when when I was studying politics and I starting to understand all those mechanisms like okay you have a company it needs to make benefits for the uh, stake, uh, shareholders so mm -hmm. um, it has to develop and developing itself it needs more resources and it does more marketing to sell more products so I was feeling that this mechanism is like um, blind blind monster you know like capitalism is going to to hit the to devour the, the entire world before we can stop it you know so i was feeling wow it's so important to feel to to feel the the source of happiness inside us because if we try to just uh, be happy through uh, cons consumerism is going to destroy the planet um yeah so this is really a message that um, spirituality can can share. Like, okay, pleasure. There's a lot of pleasure in the world, but true happiness is to be found uh, in to, like through the connection with the source. And also, I hope something that we will uh, uh, discover, but maybe we need more inspiration about that is that. You can be spiritual and connected to the world, uh, to the source, and at the same time, um, care for the world. You know, in in a loving way, like not cutting yourself from the world. Like, okay, I'm going to build my little ashram and close the doors, and then wait for, I I, I like hoping I will survive. You know, in this crazy world, I, I really believe it's not the way. Uh, even though sometimes I feel, uh, yeah, what to say when Ramana is is telling us that the world is kind of, you know, you have to forget the world. Like sometimes for me, it's hard because, for example, in the past, when uh, people ask about, ask, ask to Ramana about the Second World War, you know, they say, oh, Hitler is, is doing horrible things. And Ramana is telling them, okay, God has created the world, so let God uh, taking care of it. I'm like, wow, that's that's a kind of message like you should not do anything. And mm -hmm. maybe I, I am stupid because I am the last, the only one who really cares about the world. And I'm and and some people they it seems they have a very uh, pleasant life, not giving uh not caring about it. Mm -hmm. So if if I am sincere, I have to say sometimes I have doubts about it in my mind, but mm -hmm. my heart has no doubts. I know that whatever happened, if my heart tells me that there is something I need to do or need to change in my own life, I, I will do it. But sometimes it's hard for me to convince the others to follow me. So I try just maybe to find like-minded people and see where it goes, you know, when we, when we create this network of love, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, our, the story of Aurobindo came up while you were talking. So Aurobindo, I think, went to went away to a British school and when he came back and you know, you know col col British colonialism was happening in, in India and he became an activist <clears throat> in Calcutta and Bengal region, um, you know, against colonialism, um, just, just as what Gandhi did and they threw him in jail. And, you know, this is what, people say at the ashram and he met Krishna in jail and he had an awakening experience. And when he came out of prison, he decided he no longer wanted to be an activist and he just wanted to help others reach a higher state of consciousness. And in a lot of his books, he talked 
a lot about the post-human, what's after the human. And then he escaped to French Pondicherry and opened up his ashram. But I, I, um, but I believe, you know, each one of us has to go through a similar journey where we are an activist and then we reach a certain point where we no longer want to be an activist and we work on spiritual ascension, but there's no way around it. There's the only way is through, you know, we cannot, we cannot just skip the steps. We have to be an activist first and we have to try. And then when I feel our soul is ready or with the help of deities and they say, it's no longer time for you to be an activist. Now it's time for you to work on your um, spirituality or meditation or whatever it is. Then we do that, but we have we 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 have to listen to our soul's need, you know. And if now is a time of activism or speaking out or raising awareness, and that's what our soul is telling us to do, and that's what our heart is telling us to do, then that's what we must do. Otherwise, this is what causes disease. You know, they say disease. It's when we're not listening to what our soul is trying to do. And so we must listen and and do what our soul wants to do. <laughs> that's the only way. The only way is through. <laughs> that's, a, that's a beautiful uh, message. Um, is there anything else that you want to share today? Um, I think... I just want everyone to keep praying for peace and hoping for peace, but also raising awareness wherever you are. Keep, you know, pray a lot, chant a lot, meditate a lot, whatever it is, whatever it is your practice, but also, you know, make sure that you elect conscious leaders that are also for the same ideals. Um, we have to do both. We have to be spiritual, but also make sure that we have, the rise of conscious leaders on this planet and that requires voting and that requires you know being participating in town hall meetings or doing these type of discussions or speaking your truth even if it's scary you know and so um there's you know there's that loka samasta suki no bhavantu is one of my favorite mantras if you like mantras you know sing that one as much as you can um yeah and i think that's that's when we will have peace um there was a beautiful story that i heard where a hundred meditators got together i think it was a hundred or it might be more and they folk and they've been doing this for maybe a decade or more and they focus on a particular conflict and in this particular case they focused on the conflict in sri lanka and they were meditating for peace for a couple of days now i was in sri lanka last year and i, I found out that uh sri lanka's war went on for 30 years so of course i was heartbroken i was like we do not want that for ukraine and these meditators got together for a couple of days and thought about peace and within a week of after that conference of meditators um there was a series of events that happened in sri lanka and the war ended so i'm a firm believer in prayer and collective prayer do not fall into the fear and all the games that's being played on TV, um, try to vote for conscious leaders, but also keep hoping for peace, praying for peace. As a child would, <laughs> never should, never lose your childish innocence. Because <laughs> a lot of people have become cynical and angry. We can't have that. We cannot have our vibration drop. We have to keep our vibration high, as high as possible. And that comes through prayer and singing and meditation. Thank you so much, uh, Catherine. And uh, uh, yeah, if, uh, if people have uh, questions and everything, uh, they can uh, comment. Uh, I don't know if there is a way also to, um, to contact you. I mean, do you have like a, a YouTube channel or website or something like that? I don't have a website. I have a YouTube channel, it's called dragon stories but i there isn't a way you can contact me there so i guess the best way would be to email me and uh at k-a-t-h-r-u-d-k-a at gmail.com okay i will i will uh, i will put that into the the uh, presentation of the video uh also one question i ask uh, like last question i ask to my uh 
the people I speak with on the show. Uh, do you have like any book or movie that you would like to recommend uh, for people to be inspired or something you are reading right now? Um, well, right now, actually, let me get this book. <clears throat> I'm actually reading three books right now. Um, the Surrender Experiment by Michael A. Singer. It's wow. an amazing one. I love surrender. this. I love this man, and I love this uh, this book very much. Yeah, this um, for all the French people that know Saima. I recently met her, so she's a she's a jagat guru, the first jagat guru in twenty four hundred years, and she's from France, and she was just in uh, New York. So I got to meet her and got blessed by her. Wow, I I and never she, I never heard about her. Yeah. Uh, so she's um she's honored as an enlightened master and the first female jagat guru in more than 2700 years of the vishnu swami lineage so she's also uh you know a big fan of mantras and reciting mantras and meditation and following your heart so i got to meet her like about a month ago and then i have the the art of loving eric Fromm. <laughs> Wow. But also, I highly recommend people to read Robert Kennedy's books. Okay. He's written four um, about vaccines, if you don't know much about vaccines, because he's been in a lot of lawsuits and children getting hurt by these vaccines. His last two books was about, is like this thick. Uh, one is about, called The Real Anthony Fauci, and it's all about the, the citations and the research is like this, you know, 15 pages long, but the book is this thick and it's all about the pharmaceutical industry and the harm that it's done. And as well as the Wuhan cover up was his latest book. Um, so I think people need to be educated by these industries because right now in California, one out of every 22 children are autistic. And this is because of the vaccines. The vaccine schedule for one for 2025 is now at almost at 120 shots they want to give. So they're giving babies shots as soon as they arrive into the world and no one has done studies of what happens when you give shot after shot after shot and so we have the highest autism rates now in the world um and one out of 36 nationally so we're having children that are banging their heads that are toe walking that are unable to speak and this is all from the vaccine industry so people need to educate especially if you're a mother especially if you're a father and you have young children, you have to be very careful with the pharmaceutical industry because it's damaging a lot of children. So please read those Robert Kennedy's books. Thank you, Kate, for sharing that and for being that uh, brave, uh, powerful, spiritual woman. Um, I'm very uh, uh, grateful uh, to have the opportunity to, uh, to exchange with you. and. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Satya Dev. It was great. <laughs> great talking with you. <laughs>